Okay, friends and colleagues, it's really good to see you and be here with you. Um, what we're going to do is get going now. So what I want to do, first of all, is to just say one or two bits of information about how this is going to proceed. Uh, many of you will have either been present at the actual Boyle lecture itself or just heard it uh, electronically now. So we're not, therefore, going to start with either Chris Southgate or with Andrew Davison, we're going to start with one or two respondents. And the first one is going to be Celia Dean Drummond, who will have a few minutes to respond. We may then be joined by Oliver Davis, who at the last minute has stepped in because very unfortunately, Ariel Glücklich, who was going to have responded, has been taken ill. What I'll do then, once we've heard from Celia and possibly Oliver as well, is give both Chris and David, uh, Chris and Andrew, a chance to respond if they wish to. And then we're going to open it up to the rest of us. And one of the useful things about a manageable number is we'll be able to use common sense. People can use the raised hand facility. Uh, if you've got your video on, frankly, you can just wave at me desperately. And the idea is we'll then give uh, the original two speakers and Celia and Oliver, if he's with us, a chance. And we'll just go as long as we feel it's worthwhile going with the proviso that the utter latest we will be finishing by is UK time, 8 p.m., 20 hundred hours. So with that preliminary uh, and particular thanks to Anthony, who, as many of you know, had to put in a ridiculous number of hours doing some sort of technical job to get the video and the audio adequately aligned. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to meet this evening. So many thanks to Anthony. Celia, I believe you were very kindly going to start with a number of minutes, reflections, remarks, comments, responses. Over to you. Hey, okay, so thank you everybody here for, for joining. Uh, you know, after listening to Chris's lecture and reading the text, I just want to express, first of all, my admiration for what Chris has achieved in a, in a lifetime of studying this topic. Um, I can't think of anyone who's thrown so much weight and energy and time into really getting into the, the depths of some of the issues around the area of evolutionary theodicy. Um, and so really my, my first comment is one of appreciation really and not only that but also his what I would call epistemic humility of being prepared to always be on the move um, that takes a bit of courage <laughs> so thank you Chris for, for being willing to do that um, and I think I should sort of also say that his has been not only an important co um, contribution to the theology and science debate it's also been crucial for eco-theology as a whole as a field because in that field, there's a tendency to be rather rosy um, eyed spectacles about what the creation is and not actually look at the suffering and the and the woundedness of creation that Chris talks about so eloquently in his various books and articles and, and so on. And so in as far as I'm joining the club of others like Andrew Davison and Chris, who's had a background in science and are now theologians, I'm, I have much in common with Chris, and I've always admired his work over must be more than a quarter of a century or longer. So it's a real honour and privilege to be to be asked to, to give a very brief um, response, um, not a formal response, but more of a conversational response. So I'm going to divide my very short remarks into two two sort of um, stanza, if you will, if you want to use the poetic expression. The first is areas of convergence, which I've already started to highlight, but more specifically about this issue of theodicy or evolutionary theodicy. And the second are areas where maybe we part company. And so the first in terms of areas in common, I think the distinction between um, suffering and, and death and pain and and all those other areas that, that Chris highlights is in his work is one that I also appreciate. So in other words, he makes nuanced distinctions between mortality that is not necessarily an evil and other forms of acute suffering and how, where those distinctions slide into one another or not. Um, and also, of course, the reality of suffering in non-humans, which sometimes even today is denied by some philosophers. <clears throat> 
and also in his the second half of his talk I think we came closer to converging than we ever have up till this date so that's why I was really excited to read some of that because I also think there is this pre there are pre-human tendencies to evil I don't call it sin in my work I refrain from that I do call it the possibility of evil and um, I use the language of shadow Sophia deliberately because the shadow sort of passes through all creation oh, and uh, it's also a, a paradox because in a book that I wrote or was published last year called Shadow Sophia the Evolution of Wisdom Volume 2 the evolution of wisdom sounds more positive and it's intended to be and what I'm really arguing here is that there's a paradox in that in looking at some of these areas we learn more about what it means to be to, to express wisdom than we would otherwise if we didn't face up to that darker or shadow side. So it's not a, it's not so much um, a mystery, it's actually worked out in some detail, including thinking about things like the difference between deception and lying, for example, and also all sorts of other tendencies, um, selfishness, I, I won't go through all of that because that's, uh, you know, huge work, but I can talk about it in questions if people are interested. But then we come to the one way argument and here this um, I would say that maybe I could go with what Andrew Davison has suggested and call it a relative necessity rather than an absolute necessity. I think that probably comes closest to my position. In other words, it's inevitable, it's a relative necessity, but it's not absolute. So I think making this an ontological claim is too strong. And I feel that while Chris may not use that language, it comes close to that and where he's approaching it. So it's where the convergence and divergence start to come together. So convergent in that we both think that it's necessary to look at this seriously divergent in the way we're interpreting it. Um, and so what about other areas of divergence then? Certainly the Chris has expressed a love affair with the natural sciences as he calls it and I have much admiration for that but I think I would rather distinguish a little bit more between what I call creation and, and nature. In other words, creation is not identical to nature in the way that Chris is, seems to be implying or writes about in, in his work. Nature is discovered by the sciences, creation is a gift. The two intersect, so and but not are completely identical. Thomas Aquinas, that Andrew Davison also uses a lot, also distinguished between primary and secondary causation. So there was not exactly a let out clause for God, but there was a sense in which the secondary causation was distinguished from the primary and therefore what happens in the secondary, to some degree at least, was one step away from, from the primary causation. And I also wouldn't want to put God in every single process, so I want to make God responsible for every micro decision that's made. There's a, there is the notion of freedom in creative world through the idea of secondary causation, which I think is important to underline. In ethical terms, the naturalistic fallacy assumes that, because, that something is good because it's natural. I think if we start to merge creation and nature, it's, it, it has a tendency to lead towards not something like a naturalistic fallacy. I'm not saying that uh, Chris is guilty of that, but I think there's, a, there's a, a leaning there that we need to be aware of. Perhaps natural law is the closest we get to something like that. Um, but even there, the natural law is interpreted. It's not claiming that the natural world is an un unadulterated good, even in spite of its um, suffering, pain, etc., etc. So, So creation at the same time is the intention of the divine creator to be healed and whole and so therefore in my way of thinking at least the natural world isn't um, perfection yet but it will be in the future it's yet to be realized so I have a more eschatological way of interpreting the future of creation um, and uh, shadow Sophia which I mentioned earlier is the way creaturely Sophia indwells the creation but then becomes distorted and it's distinct from divine Sophia, which is the work of God. So I want to distinguish between divine Sophia and creaturely Sophia. Divine Sophia cannot be corrupted, but creaturely Sophia can. And of course, then we can solve the problem Christologically. And I know that while um, 
Chris has also talked about that in, in his work as well. Perhaps that's a then leaning away from divergence to convergence again. So lots of areas of divergence, lots of areas of convergence. We are close, I think, in our thinking, but those sort of differences, I think, are worth um, throwing in the ring as a way of um, stimulating discussion and debate. So thank you, Chris, for allowing me to come on this platform and I look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Well, Celia, thank you for that wonderfully rich, almost condensed response. Um, I'm going to, first of all, therefore, Chris, give you a chance to respond. And probably those of us who don't have the floor should always just check that we're muted. So, Chris, up to you whether you'd like to either respond to or, you know, riff off anything that Celia has said. Um, well, Celia and I have have been in conversation for 35 years probably and uh, it's always a rich exchange and um, I think one interesting thing about it is that convergence uh, seems to be increasing over the years. Um, one thing I, I wanted to, um, to draw out during our conversation was this issue of uh, absolute and relative necessities and I wonder whether it'd be helpful because Andrew didn't um, include that in his video uh, response. I wonder if it'd be helpful to ask him just to say two minutes about absolute and relative necessities and then perhaps I could uh, come back in and uh, say a bit more about what Celia said. Would that be okay? Andrew, are you happy to dive in now? Yes, I'll try and uh, do it justice. Uh, there are all sorts of forms of necessity. I got my dictionary of scholastic philosophy down off the shelf and there were pages of different definitions, but I, I picked out two and I had written a little piece in the response, but I thought that uh, on, the, on the night, it was best to keep it short. And um, uh, so that didn't get, uh, didn't get talked about, but um, my, one of my questions then was uh, what kind of necessity we're we talking about if we're talking about only way and two useful uh, angles on necessity are absolute necessity sometimes called metaphysical necessity the idea that it just couldn't possibly be otherwise perhaps even for god um so uh that's quite disputed but uh, there are plenty of people who would say god can't make a square circle um, it's necessary that a cir circle is not square because um, that, that just follows from the definitions. Um, uh, but the other sort of necessity, sometimes called Aristotelian necessity, hypothetical necessity, um, relative necessity, that's to say um, A doesn't have to be, but if you do have A, then certain things will follow from it. And that might uh, work out quite nicely in, um, in what we heard from Professor Southgate that uh, you know, God doesn't have to create a universe. But if God was going to create a universe in which, and God maybe doesn't have to create a universe like this one, but if there was going to be one like this one, then certain things will be entailed by it. Um, and in that sort of relative necessity, we, we will be talking about, um, well, I'll let um, Professor Southgate talk about how that might work out in his own thinking. Uh, and other examples, so uh, examples um, in, in Aquinas would include, he says, uh, if God doesn't, have to, God doesn't have to create a universe, but he thinks it would have to include heavenly motion, like the kind of heavenly motion that we see. He writes somewhere that um, God doesn't have to create human beings, but if he does, they ought to have hands or they need to have hands because he thinks that that's just integral to being a rational animal like we are. And I, I came up with uh, actually a surprising number of uh, examples of this, uh, of this relative necessity. So there's, there's a very rich seam of scholastic writing about this necessity that's sort of in the middle. It's, um, uh, it, it's a funny kind of contingent necessity or uh, the first thing is contingent, but what follows on from it is, is necessary. Um, I, I also pointed out that there are other uh, theologians who will embrace absolute necessity. So Schleiermacher, for instance, the great German uh, romantic uh, theologian uh, held that everything that God does just has to be the way that it is because it just follows absolutely necessarily from the divine being. And most recently I've been uh, reading um, David Bentley Hart's book, 
You Are Gods. So it's his most recent book at the moment, but um, they come off the press pretty quickly, so uh, that won't stand for very long. Um, and he is uh, quite Schleiermacherian in that uh, and, and uh, holds something quite close to God just having to do what God does and they're not being, he doesn't like the idea of entertaining counterfactual what if sort of uh, discussions when it comes to God. I suppose maybe Karl Barth wouldn't have wanted either. So there are two different kinds of necessity, uh, which I think might bear on this question of, uh, of only way. Now, I don't want this to be simply the whole hour of conversation between three of you, but my understanding, Chris, was that that was, as it were, a footnote, and you were now about to continue, is that right? With some uh, Yes. I, well, I, I'm uh, grateful to Andrew for the little um, section on necessity that he kindly sent me. And actually, I'm um, Celia might be glad to know that I'm very attracted to the notion of relative uh, necessity um, as being what the only way argument is. Um, uh, the, 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 that's the status of the only way argument. And, and one reason why I'm attracted to it is that um, if one does admit the existence of angels, as uh, is of course a rich strand in the tradition, then it can't be an absolute necessity that intelligent creatures must arise uh, by evolution. Um, angels will be a counterexample of that. But one could frame, it seems to me, a relative necessity in that uh, if there are to be physically embodied creatures with certain sorts of properties, they can only arise uh, through uh, the evolutionary process. And I would go on to say that um, uh, um, that the, uh, the suffering-free existence of such creatures can only be uh, the eschatological phase of their existence arising out of their uh, um, God's redemption of their physical existence. That, in other words, that God couldn't um, create uh, a heaven for animals uh, de novo. Uh, so, uh, so I'm very attracted to that kind of argument, and will be interested to see what um, what others uh, think about it. Um, I'll, I need to diverge from Celia somewhere, so here I'll have a go. <laughs> um, in that I, I also uh, think eschatology is hugely um, important uh, in, in this uh, subject of uh, evolutionary theodicy, but I see a um, a decisive uh, shift that is brought about by the Christ event that <clears throat> uh, that, that in, in, inaugurates the eschatological phase of cre creation, which wouldn't have got there uh, in any other way. Um, so uh, yes, God's intention is is ultimately that. Um, uh, contains that ultimate goal, um, but it's not realized only by the processes um, that we've been talking about, <coughs> processes of creation, but also and vitally through the incarnation and uh, passion. I'm not certain how much you succeeded in differing from what Celia would have said, but I'm not going to give her the chance to say so because I'm now going to give Andrew the chance to more as we well respond to anything Celia said, and then we'll move on. Well, I think really that I've uh, probably said en enough already. I just wanted to uh, point out that there's a, a beautiful passage in the Confessions of Augustine where he says, I no longer wanted everything to be as noble and exalted as it possibly could be, and I saw that the higher and the lower together are even better than the higher by itself. And that's reflected later on, uh, plenty of the scholastics will say, um, there would be something missing in creation if, if all, all sorts of br broad uh, grades were not there. So um, just to have angels would not be enough. It's also, you want something like plants, you want something like uh, other animals, and you want something like human beings. So that I think would play into your, uh, what you've just said, uh, Christopher, that, um, uh, that, that there should be, 
some things within creation that are fallible, finite, um, well, I suppose all creatures are finite, but uh, pr prone to, to death and material and have the possibility of going astray. Maybe that, that there should be at least some things that would have something like an evolutionary process to them. That would count as one of the grades that creation would be lacking if it uh, and, and missing something if they weren't there. Thank you. Now, um, to lose one respondent, Eric Lukli, you know, is unfortunate, but but I'm afraid it looks rather careless. We've lost Oliver as well. However, I have good news, and that is Fraser, and I'm paraphrasing his offer, is prepared to do an Oliver Davis impersonation. And I felt this was too good an offer to pass up. So Fraser, uh, a contribution from you, and then genuinely we'll open it up to the floor. Thanks very much. So I'm, I have I have in front of me a text that Oliver sent over about five o'clock uh, on what he was going to say. And he started from the remark that Christopher Southgate made that the impact of the angelic rebellion gathers to a climax in the battle for the human spirit, a battle Christians confess to have been won on the cross of Christ. And then Oliver says, the first important thing to note here is that we should indeed look to Christ as the source of theodicy, but we need to be more specific than this. The divine drama occurs in Jesus himself, in the orientation of his embodied will or obedience, in his intrinsic and astonishing openness, and in his fundamental freedom. I think theodicy is left behind here, what we have is practice or practices, the practice of Jesus' unparalleled openness to the world, even while he's subject to random and seemingly chaotic violence. Modern Westerners may have some difficulty in following this. For us, since the Enlightenment, freedom always tends to be assertive, as freedom from or freedom to which Levinas referred to as forming a totality. The openness and freedom of Jesus on the cross is not assertive, however. It's an obedience that is transformed as loving openness to the Father and the Spirit through the cosmos. Openness of body is a kind of openness to the world. It begins in the neutral explosions of the maternal gaze and is constantly renewed through active relationship. One of the key questions for us today, then, is to what extent it's the case that we're now moving into a third phase, from pre-modern to modern, and now to contemporary, in which new forms of change are already becoming evident. This may point to the fact that the kind of cosmic order which powerfully predominated in the early church may now be returning in part, though in a very different form. Entanglement and superposition point to a very different kind of language, but this way of speaking may be able to open doors with respect to understanding the cosmos and understanding how we can belong in this cosmos in new ways, and above all, in terms of the openness of the body of Jesus himself. Well, Oliver, thank you very much indeed. Um, Cara Fraser, uh, Chris, and then Andrew, a chance to respond to anything that, you know, Oliver Var Fraser has, has said? Uh, <clears throat> well, that was uh, very rich and 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 helpful and um, I have a lot of convergence with it to, to, to use uh, Celia's term uh, and I mean a great question uh, posed by the sort of scheme I offered is um, why if, uh, if victory is won over evil at the cross and resurrection, why is uh, its realization so long deferred, and and why does the um, wh why do both the human and the non-human realms uh, continue to suffer and groan so profoundly? And I suppose the answer that I uh, tend to offer to that is. Um, 
is one derived from that passage of Paul's in Romans 8, that the, uh, the liberation of the rest of creation is awaiting the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In other words, that um, not until human beings as a whole can uh, accept the kind of freedom that uh, Oliver so beautifully articulated as being present in Christ, not, not until human beings can come into that sort of freedom uh, will God realize uh, the rest of God's purposes for the non-human uh, creation. So, um, so, so uh, the rest of creation awaits our um, our spirit-informed acceptance of that freedom, uh, but uh, the process is, as as we know so well, um, tragically slow and often seems to go backwards. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Andrew, you don't have to, but anything you'd like to say in response to all of those thoughts? Well, more really picking up something that um, Professor Southgate just uh, said. Um, I think if it hadn't been for your last sentence, then I perhaps would have come back to the point that I'd made in the re response about different kinds of thinking um, and perhaps the importance of, of a dramatic mode of thinking, which of course also um, Celia Dean Drummond has written very much about. Um, and we could say, well, it's God taking our temporality seriously and the nature of creatures being as we are and that we're kind of, we're in a drama. Um, I think, uh, that maybe some of the general worry about theodicy would would uh, would come back there. That I'm um, that it's fine for me, who's uh, able to be a spectator in a drama. But um, uh, if if you're the one who's having the tragedy happening to you, then it's a bit different. But uh, but the perhaps the point uh, that you that you really threw up there at the very end is things seem to go backwards. So I think the the dramatic answer, uh, letting us have our time, letting things unfold in time, uh, works better perhaps if we think. That things are proceeding uh, in a dramatically pleasing kind of way but uh, if things just seem to be randomly moving along and in fact sometimes making pretty bad lurches backwards then that that, that dramatic interpretation perhaps um, becomes a bit more difficult to entertain thank you now what i'm going to do is first of all allow mark to voice or develop something he put in the chat um, and while he's doing it, can I encourage other people to think if they'd like to ask a question or make a comment? And can I reassure you, you don't have to be, as it were, following on from the half hour conversation we've been having. It's absolutely fine if you simply want to ask a question or make a comment that relates to something that Chris said in his lecture or that Andrew said in his response. So, Mark, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's very nice to join into the conversation. Thanks very much um, for all that's been said. And it's in a way, it's um, been it's hovering around my thought in what's be, just been said, actually, which is about the nature of time. And I wondered whether you felt it might make any difference if time can be experienced in different ways, much as reality perhaps has very different dramatically different dimensions um you know the, the the presence of fallen angels and so on has been um, a big part of the discussion and so subspecie eternitatis this might look all very different indeed and perhaps there's an analog here in certainly in the human experience of suffering but i appreciate that we're talking about it more broadly than that but even i think there'd be evidence in animal suffering that um it can look very different um after time, um, or even maybe with different experiences of consciousness, um, our suffering can feel very different as well. I mean, my cat, for example, had an ear infection that was so smelly, I didn't know anything about it until it stank. And if that was the case for a human being, they would have been rolling around in agony and we didn't notice any behavioral difference at all. And I just wondered about different experiences of consciousness um, as well. Um, you know, if we kind of cut reality vertically, as it were, do you think that might make a difference to um, your, uh, what, you, what you might say? Chris, 
you don't have to respond to every one of these rather challenging questions, <laughs> but if you first and then Andrew wish to, please feel able to. Um, I, I'm probably not not the best person to respond because I have a rather plodding linear understanding of time, which perhaps doesn't do justice to the subtle idea of what Mark was saying. But I do um, I venture a further thought, which um, doesn't it doesn't quite address your point, but I, I think it seems to be a very important one, which which is that um, the relentless linearity of the the Christian drama, to to use that um, pick up on that term of Andrews, um, the uh, that I think is not a help to us in the the current predicament we face in relation to climate change, um, because we are looking for sustainable practices. We are looking for, in a sense, to to find kind of uh, sustainable cycles of living, um, and. Uh, and I think that the, um, the, 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 the tendency of the Christian narrative, but more sharply in some schools than in others, but uh, it, it's not necessarily in favor of that. And, um, and, and we need to recover a, uh, a wisdom which uh, enables us to work more cyclically and less eschatologically, if you like. Uh, so that wasn't an answer, I know, but it was a, uh, it was a, a, what I thought was an important thought about time. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to or not? Well, I think this question of time maps very nicely onto another question, which is how big is the entity that we're trying to think about? Uh, because if you go up sufficient levels, then the suffering of a lower level sort of folds into the success of the higher level. Uh, so we think nothing of the fact that our uh, cells will commit apoptosis because it's for the sake of the, of, the, of the wider good. And generally, when you, I'm sure perhaps uh, necessarily, when you get to a larger scale, the time scale also tends to be longer. So one of the ways of approaching this lengthening the time scale is also to say, well, it's the good of the species, for instance. Um, and, the, and the further you go up, uh, the, the more the, the suffering of the lower levels uh, resolves itself. And we've tended in Christianity resolutely to have a sort of personalist um, uh, impulse and say you can't subordinate the good of the individual to any larger good. But um, that in a way is a, is a sticking point for us in theodicy, because if we could do that, then all sorts of problems would go away. Absolutely, uh, paranormal, yeah. etc. Chris, do you want to very briefly well, respond? And I'll go yes, to no, no, I, I agree with that, but but I um, I do think that uh, that the instinct that, that that suffering is in the individual and has to be focused upon in the individual is the right instinct, and of course that that is what Ivan Karamazov was. Oh, I agree. I'm not saying that we should yeah. jettison it. It's just that maybe we should take pride in the fact that we don't jettison it, because if we did, uh, things would get yes. quite easier. And it's good to be explicit about it. Thank you both. Bernard, you were going to shift a little bit, I believe. Uh, well, actually, I think it, my comment follows on quite naturally from what Andrew and Christopher have just said. Um, I should explain that I'm a cosmologist rather than a theologian. Uh, but one of the things that always strikes one as, as a cosmologist is that the universe does seem to be designed um, for the evolution of complexity um, due to fine tuning or whatever and that this culminates in, in mankind if you like or at least consciousness in some general sense and, uh, and another interesting point is that from a purely cosmological standpoint everything hinges on the fact that the universe isn't perfect if everything was perfectly symmetrical, nothing would work. So the only reason we're here in some sense is because they're, they're these little um, 
imperfections. And I don't know whether that's an analogy to, to the problem of evil and suffering, but I, I just thought I'd say that as a, a side remark. But what I'm really interested in as a cosmologist is the question of whether we have to regard humanity as the culmination of evolution. Because I think most of Christopher's comments were in the context of humanity. But what we learn from, from cosmology is that probably, you know, mankind is not unique. I mean, that there are probably millions of, of planets with millions of um, spirits, if you like, or millions of souls, however you want to look at it. And, and the question is, when one talks about suffering, one has to, the, the suffering on the planetary level or on the species level, but you've got to see it also within the broader perspective of, of um, life as a whole within the universe. And one can see there might be what's good for, what's good for the universe, well, let's say be more parochial, what's good for the galaxy may not be good for, for the individual planet. There might be all sorts of reasons why we need to suffer on a, on a, on a planetary level for, for the greater good, if you like. Now, I realize that's that's jumping uh, way beyond the topic Christopher was originally addressing, but I'll be very interested in his comments on how he would have changed his view of suffering if he put it in that broader context. Um, well, uh, one or two thoughts. Um, first, I, I was precisely not supposing that human beings are the culmination of evolution, but rather that <clears throat> that God desired the arising of all sorts of different kinds of uh, creaturely properties of which uh, um, human self-consciousness is, is only one. And I think the, <clears throat> the over-anthropocentrism of uh, much of this debate has been to its, uh, to its uh, demerit. Um, but... Um, it, it, uh, yes. Um, I mean, the question of whether something might, uh, something might be good for the galaxy that was bad for the planet uh, maps onto the discussion we were just having about whether, uh, <clears throat> whether individual suffering is necessarily um, fundamentally important and, and whether it generates uh, the need for theodicy of itself, and I would want to go on insisting that it does. Um, I mean, I am um, uh, very excited by the current uh, directions of exoplanet research and uh, I'm inclined to think that, um, uh, that life of some form um, might very well abound in the universe at the same time I'm influenced by Simon Conway Morris's recent arguments that, that, that perhaps intelligent life uh, might be vanishingly rare. Um, so um, so uh, that remains, I think, a fascinating debate. It's one on which uh, Andrew's also, uh, uh, your new book, I think, is in this area, isn't it? Yeah. Well, of course, yes, we, we still don't know um, whether life is abundant, and we could, of course, yeah, be the only yeah. source of life in the galaxy, which would make us obviously have all sorts of theological implications. But it's just, it strikes me that when you look on, on the planet Earth, the evolution on the planet Earth, what is, what is good for one species is necessarily bad for another species, and, and evolution is powered basically by, by you know, death of species. And... Uh, and so one might imagine that, and therefore, in some sense, suffering is a necessary part of, of the, the greater good of the planet. And I was really just extrapolating that question to even beyond the planet, I suppose. Yeah. Ernst, you were going to come in with a question or comment. Thank you, Michael. Sorry, I had to switch on my, my microphone. And thank you for the opportunity. It's wonderful to be able to participate from afar, from South Africa, um, seeing so many old friends and, and, and wishing I could participate in the conversation itself. Chris, um, I've posted a question in the, uh, in the chat that you may want to have a look at in, later in detail. It concerns in your lecture the, um, the notion of these resistances 
So I, I'm saying that resistance is, of course, not by itself a bad thing. Uh, it's actually very welcome. But could you say something more about the difference between, let's say, viral resistances or um, parasitical resistances and what you termed, I think, oddly, spiritual resistances? These clearly cannot be the same because they work in different ways. Um, I was thinking of top-down or bottom-up causation or influence or something like that. Um, but isn't it intriguing that uh, to consider the possibility of such influences of forms of intelligence that could be higher than our own, um, where we find ourselves in a world already messed up um, and something that from which we cannot escape, but because it's it's there. Um, and I was playing with the idea of Omona Lady. So if Omona Lady and human beings coexisted and they found themselves in a world messed up to which they probably contributed as well a little bit, but by intelligences higher than their own, who are we to think that um, we are the highest intelligence ever around and, and, and cannot be influenced by powers beyond our comprehension? I wouldn't want to go to the angels, but <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, you were doing so well Ernst, until you turned your back on the angels. Um, but I, I, I'm quite happy to um, uh, to call them spiritual influences instead. And what I, the the model which I was very provisionally and tentatively offering was that um, that there can't, there might be. Uh, on the edge of the pro processes of um, uh, evolution, including um, the um, predation and all its accompanying suffering, on, on the edge of those processes, there might be um, examples of where uh, entities um, had um, had been influenced, tempted, if you like, by uh, by spiritual influences in in those kind of counter evolutionary ways that I was talking about with cancer and <clears throat> and um, with viruses. And um, I mean that's a very tentative guess, but I think it's um, uh, it's fueled by. Uh, my um, discomfort with an absolute cutoff, which says that um, uh, in humans we have uh, freely cho chosen sin, and uh, 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 but we don't see anything like that in the non-human world. So I was just uh, I was casting out some suggestions, building partly on Celia's work, but also. Um, just trying to extrapolate a little into um, uh, into some of the um, um, most troubling areas of biology. Andrew, just to check, anything you want to respond to on the issues raised by Bernard or Ernest? Not particularly, thank you. That's great, because that gives us the chance to go straight to Tim. Here I am. Uh, thank you all once again for this marvelous opportunity to attend and to discuss and to respond. No matter where we are in the world, it's it's a, a real joy to have this opportunity, especially when some other organizations are loosening restrictions after COVID and are making these digital opportunities uh, less available. Um, but uh, the, to the question itself, um, so Professor Southgate, I, I, it seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong that you're distinguishing between simple pain which can be seen to have to, to be sort of serve sort of a necessary function and and to be you know not necessarily theologically problematic and uh, and what you call an overplus of suffering and struggle that um, that does require a response and it's it's that that notion of, of overplus that in the the theodicy uh, literature has has caused me uh, well quite a bit of questioning. I, I wonder how we can go about and determine, uh, how we go about determining what the difference is between a, 
a, a reasonable amount of pain and suffering and the amount of pain and suffering that we that we in fact have whether making that distinction is is sort of cutting against the um the uh the the, the only way or the best way argument that, that you're making in the first place and by by quantifying pain in this way you know are we sort of putting ourselves on a on a, a utilitarian road in which we're going to be talking about you know dolors versus hedons and and how we we quantify the, the distinction between the amount of pleasure and pain that uh, the created beings suffer. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think I'd, um, uh, I, I'd, I'm sure there are uh, subtleties which are not yet occurring to me, but um, the, the key question for me is whether the um, whether the harm and the pain stroke suffering that it causes the individual creature, whether that benefits the individual creature or whether it only benefits the, uh, the, the system more widely through, um, um, through, through its um, uh, interaction with the ecosystem or through the evolution of its species. Um, so I was um, I was pointing out that, that that pain responses benefit the individual by teaching it um, to avoid noxious stimuli, or, or they can do. But but where the situation is such that um, uh, the, the the pain is intense and chronic, and the stimuli can't be avoided, uh, then the individual is no longer benefiting, although those processes may benefit the, the species or the predator or whatever. So, um, and this, this of course is a, um, uh, it maps onto a key uh, move in theodicy, which my students are always offering me, which is that veil of soul making um, argument that, uh, that uh, harms teach us virtue um, but uh, so often in the biological world harms uh, don't teach the individual creature virtue because it's uh, um, it's just um, it's just a football for the hyenas and then it's dead so um, that that's what I was after really in that kind of distinction thank you we're obviously getting towards the end now. If anybody, especially somebody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question or make a comment, wants to do so very briefly, we can squeeze that in now. Go for it, John. You're not quite yet muted. I can see you're trying, John, but we haven't yet got you so we can hear you, you're still muted. There we are. Excellent. Well, just to say an enormous pleasure to be here and also for me to say to Chris and Andrew, how much I've enjoyed and valued what you've said. What I just wanted to mention is actually relating to Tim's point uh, and to what Chris has also said on on the balance, as it were, between the pain and the and the pleasure. And I've always been intrigued by the fact that Darwin himself, who really underlined the extent of suffering, and particularly that of non-human suffering, which he says you know, we neglect. Uh, too much. It's a pity theologians didn't notice that and learn from, from what Charles Darwin himself said. But the comment I particularly wanted to make that I find intriguing is that Darwin himself weighed up the pros and the cons, um, which was the, the more predominant in creation. And he says that on balance, for most creatures, the pleasure outweighs the pain. Otherwise, the species would never have propagated itself. 
And so one actually gets a kind of throwback to the evolutionary science in Darwin's own mind in resolving that particular conundrum about where do you place your money? And I'm happy to say, really, he, he places his money on the happiness side. Well, thank you very much. So it's Darwin once again coming to the rescue of theology. Christopher, any final comment you'd like to make in literally just a sentence or two? Um, yes, well, that's, that's very, very helpful. And, um, uh, and, and Darwin is salutary in this regard, I think, uh, um, when he says that there's grandeur in this view of life, despite, despite all the war that it contains. But it's the, um, uh, and I think that argument um, uh, works at the level of the system that on balance, um, creatures thrive more often than not, and so they propagate and so on, yes. Um, but the theodicist, I think, must be concerned with the uh, very many um, uh, cases in which the creature doesn't thrive. Uh, I mean, uh, famously, Holmes Ralston's example of the insurance pelican chick, who um, is uh, is only ha the second chick who's only hatched as insurance and whose life uh, ninety percent of the time uh, consists of nothing but starvation and early death, and that's an evolutionary strategy. And we can say, you know, on balance, it's splendid, but but um, God, I believe, has a care for the chick as well. So it's always difficult to know when to finish, but we're going to finish on that particular example of pelicans and their insurance chicks. Huge thanks to Fraser as Executive Secretary of ISSR and to Anthony as Executive Assistant for the vast amount of work that goes on in the background. Thanks to Ariel, who did the work to respond, but then wasn't able to. I'm, I'm hoping we simply lost Oliver in cyberspace. That, but particular thanks to Chris and to Andrew. And that, I think, honestly concludes it for today. Do keep well and safe until hopefully many of us meet again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>